Yeah, so years ago we got together and decided carbon emissions are bad. So hydrogen looked in the past like it could be a replacement fuel for gasoline. It's easy to fill up the tank and you have hundreds of miles of range just like a gas car. Turns out that's wrong. It turns out electric is better. So then why do we keep talking about hydrogen? Huh? Well, hydrogen is still useful, just not for cars. But we still gotta figure out what happened to hydrogen cars in an entertaining and informative manner. Reason number one, hydrogen cars are not green. Basically, you have three types of hydrogen. There's gray, blue, and green hydrogen. Gray is hydrogen extracted from fossil fuel gas that releases CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. This is approximately 96% of all hydrogen currently. And it's bad. Blue hydrogen is extracted from fossil gas before CO2 emissions are then trapped and stored permanently underground. And finally, you have green hydrogen, which is extracted from water and releases oxygen into the air. This is not even 2% of all hydrogen as well, so the vast majority is the nasty, dirty gray hydrogen. I don't know why we call them gray, blue, and green. We should just call them bad, decent, and good. <laughs> I know exactly why. It's because fossil fuel companies push this kind of hydrogen to obfuscate and make it difficult to understand. The, the hydrogen industry has a lot of fossil fuel special interests involved, but uh, it's a long tangent. But let's get back to hydrogen. Okay, so. Raise number two. Look what I can do. <laughs> what? What does that have to do with me? No, no. He's got a point. Reason number three, hydrogen is inefficient. The process used for making green hydrogen is called electrolysis, and it takes about 50 kilowatt hours of electricity to produce one kilo of hydrogen fuel. The Toyota Mirai is the most sold hydrogen vehicle, and it can travel about 100 kilometers using one kilo of hydrogen. You can therefore say it takes about 55 kilowatt hours of electricity per 100 kilometers of distance. An electric car needs less than 20 kilowatt hours to drive the exact same distance. So in other words, per mile or per kilometer, or whatever unit of measurement you want to use, a hydrogen car is about three times less energy efficient than a battery electric vehicle. What I have seen from hydrogen at the moment suggests that it is far dirtier than gasoline. So yeah, because of this efficiency loss, in effect, a hydrogen car ends up just being an electric car with extra steps. Reason number four. Splitting oxygen molecules requires expensive platinum catalyst additives and has cathode activation inefficiency. Understandable. Hydrogen vehicles require a device called a fuel cell instead of a battery. Inside of a fuel cell, electricity is harvested when hydrogen gas molecules are split, okay? We can't just do this alone though. We also have to split an oxygen molecule as well, which then binds with the hydrogen, the split hydrogen forming water, and then we can basically vape that water out of the car. Splitting oxygen molecules is challenging though. It means we need a, <coughs> bless you. We need rare and expensive platinum, which acts as a catalyst, which makes it easier to split the molecules. Understandably, it's difficult to get platinum. It's a rare metal, and as far as I know, there's no substitute. Meanwhile, lithium, nickel, and cobalt make up the bulk of an EV battery. Those metals are way more common than platinum, full stop. There's also energy loss in this process, which is called cathode activation inefficiency. This all leads us to reason number 4.5, which is deeply related to number four about inefficiency, but hydrogen is expensive. It's not even remotely economical to produce with renewable methods, and the cheapest and most economical method is to take methane, or natural gas, kind of the same thing, and crack it into CO2 plus H2 with pressurized steam. The cheapest that we have is still not cheap. So if it's not even cheaper, if emissions are still going into the atmosphere, you kind of got to go the full way or none at all. Like people will say, oh, it's because hydrogen is more efficient than gas cars. And it is, uh, so it's less emissions therefore. And then they'll also say, oh, and we can eventually do properly green hydrogen in the future. So yeah, that's okay, those are kind of half reasons. But at that point, electric is just way better. It achieves the same result, but does things faster and more cheaper. <laughs> and none of that is actually mentioning the fact that the starting price for a hydrogen vehicle these days is $50,000.
Like, meanwhile, electric cars are coming in all shapes and sizes, and their prices are dropping as supply chains ramp up and as everyone gets on board with them. Reason number six. Their range is overrated. One of the biggest selling points of hydrogen used to be that it provided drivers with better range. Into like the hundreds of miles, high hundreds of kilometers, right? But EV range is starting to get a whole lot better these days. And especially as prices are dropping, people are getting less anxious about it. You know, it turns out that when the price of batteries drops, people can sacrifice a little bit of range because you get all sorts of other benefits with EVs. Like for example, the fuel that you put into them is cheaper. The electricity is just cheaper than gas in many places. Like maybe not in the United States of, of Gasistan, but as they got cheap gas there. But yeah, in most countries, electricity is cheaper than gas. Okay, so let me illustrate. The Tesla Model Y sold like over 700,000 units last year, and it was the globe's best selling electric automobile. More than double the next biggest model of car sold. Okay, pretty impressive. So look at this shit. You take a Model Y, you make the 12 hour drive from New York to Chicago. You're not stopping that often. Uh, you budget in some 20 to 30 minute stops here and there. You get a coffee, you get a refreshment, let your Elon mobile recharge and then hit the road afterwards. Like what's the big deal, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is being a little conservative to like, save your battery's longevity. Like if you don't let it go below 10% and you don't charge it past 90%, like you could be more aggressive and do it faster. Yeah, well, I mean like people normally take 15 minute breaks during a drive. Sure, I mean, you shouldn't be driving for 12 hours straight anyway. Like the thing is I've driven electric cars on long trips before and charging wasn't really a big problem. It needs a little more planning than using fossil fuels, but turns out I want to rest at about the same interval that the car wants charging. Folks out there who can drive eight hours in one go, good luck, but I am not one of you. I mean, t Teslas and stuff are becoming autonomous anyway, as well, so you're not even necessarily driving for that time. I don't know, we treat it like this great inconvenience, but how, how often are you actually realistically driving those kinds of distances anyway, you know? Uh, the vast majority of driving is within like 100 miles or even 50 miles of your own house. Mm -hmm. Like the vast majority of driving. Yeah. So if you ever need to do a road trip, it's still very doable as you can see here. Like it's just, you know, you just gotta take a few more stops. Yeah, the, the point in general is that like, range anxiety is a bit silly and we simultaneously are, yeah, we're, we're getting better with EVs and we don't really necessarily need that kind of range and refuel capacity. Yeah, there is a problem with, the, with, with hydrogen fueling though. Like it's not just, it's not so easy as just, oh, it replaces gas infrastructure and it's all fine and good. Like we can just fuel up really quickly and leave. Um, the reason is because, first of all, it costs millions of dollars to make a hydrogen station, like way more than a gas station for sure. Uh, and its capacity for fueling multiple cars is really low uh, compared to both EV charge stations and gas stations. So it might be easy to fuel up a single vehicle at a hydrogen station, but in general, hydrogen needs to be cooled and compressed, uh, which severely limits like the number of cars per hour that can top up at a particular pump. Hydrogen is a highly flammable gas. The city of Nagoya in Japan is rocked by a devastating explosion. A 15 ton hydrogen tank blew up and now rescue workers brave the poisonous fumes to search in the wreckage of the chemical plant that was totally destroyed. Hydrogen is a highly flammable gas that necessitates stringent safety measures and complex designs, engineering designs, uh, so that it doesn't go screwy kablooey. It is also impossible to prevent leakages of hydrogen since the molecules are literally smaller than the tanks that hold them, meaning that it will leak straight through the material. Straight through. I think something like 1% of stored hydrogen leaks from a tank every day. New EV battery tech is looking a lot better than it used to. Sodium batteries with denser energy and way cheaper costs uh, than lithium batteries are increasingly viable. Uh, at least they're looking viable. The Japanese are putting a lot of money into them. It's important as well because right now there's only a couple of lithium suppliers. So we get like almost all lithium from just like three countries. The energy density of the batteries today can still be doubled or tripled. I want to use sodium instead of lithium because it has different properties and also sodium is much more abundant. Abundant means much cheaper. The lithium and cobalt used in your typical rechargeable batteries 
mostly come from far-flung places like Bolivia, Chile, and Congo. The sodium batteries of the future will be made of inexpensive, widely available materials. Think about it in another way. People might say, oh, it's looking like sodium batteries are not as efficient as lithium ion or they're not as energy dense, but it doesn't matter. Like, it, again, we've been talking about this, like most driving is short. So it depends what you're trying to do, right? If you're just having a little city driver, why don't you make it a lot cheaper with a sodium battery, even if the range sacrifices a little, like if you sacrifice the range a little bit. Now, so yeah, sodium is not yet like commercially viable or it's not yet like developed enough. Maybe it never will be. But the point being, if there was an option of an electric car that was half the price of lithium and 70% of the range, let's say, I mean, I would buy that, you know? Sure. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but the whole point of this is that EV batteries are the more developed technology, there's more money going into them, and they're just like more viable in general than hydrogen. Yeah, reason number six. So working with hydrogen is such a tremendous pain in the keister, <laughs> like in general. So if you're gonna envision a world where we're all zooming around in hydrogen cars, then you also have to think about the infrastructure. It's orders of magnitude easier to build a few places to plug in your car than it is to build hydrogen fueling stations. Currently, the US, which is one of the most advanced hydrogen countries, only has like a couple hundred hydrogen fueling stations. And that's compared to tens of thousands of EV charge stations, which are popping up all over the place. Look how many EV ports there were in 2018, like compared to the number of hydrogen. I mean, like only California has any appreciable amount. There was like a donut, there was a donut video uh, where the guy was like, oh, if I want to visit my parents who live in like uh, central California or at least up the coast from LA, he'd have to like fuel up and then not be able to drive when he gets to his parents' town and then would just have enough range to get back to the hydrogen station. <laughs> you know, you say, oh, you could build more hydrogen infrastructure, but it's expensive. Like it's way more expensive than gas. It's not as easy to fund. I mean, it's dangerous. I mean, hydrogen gas goes, you know, goes boom, it, it explodes. So a lot more precautions have to be taken. A lot more cost has to be taken. It's just not as simple. We have a global electricity network. It's true that we have to significantly scale it up and that's going to take like a lot of work, but it's proven technology. It's the same one that we have that we will just have to expand. It's the same thing. Now, caveats. This is why hydrogen cars and hydrogen vehicles are generally pretty bad. That does not mean that hydrogen is not useful as a green technology of the future. The fact of the matter is that we have an energy storage problem, like in general. Hydrogen is useful for transporting energy very long distances. Like, you can have a solar or wind-rich region uh, which then transports its energy to energy poor regions with hydrogen. For example, the Japanese are investing in this all over the place. Maybe you'll generate green hydrogen in the Australian outback where there's a lot of sun, and then you'll ship it on tankers to Japan, for example. Japan is energy poor. They have a lot of people, but not a lot of energy resources. How does the density of a filled energy ship of hydrogen compared to a filled energy ship of like natural gas? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a thing where... Oh. Yeah, no, true. Good point. Hydrogen has a significantly lower liquid energy density than LNG, meaning that for every LNG ship, approximately 2.4 LH2 ships would be needed to deliver the same amount of energy. Even with energy losses, hydrogen is good if we have lots of excess power, especially as the prices of renewables keeps falling, right? You can even use hydrogen to melt steel. Boom, baby, hydrogen's got a chance. Oh, time for the graphic. It's graphic time. It's graphic time. It's graphic time. Look at, I discovered this amazing graphic, which shows the viability of different energy storage technologies. Uh, well, let's explain it. Let's, I'll show you. So look. Who made it really quickly? Like Some guy on Reddit, Ian Staffel. Thanks, Ian. So on the x-axis down here, you have the frequency of discharges, uh, which is like how often per year you need to, to fill up and discharge the energy storage, okay? Yeah. On the y-axis on this side, you have the duration of hours per discharge. So in the bottom left corner, 
you'll have a low frequency of discharges per year, only like one or two, three times, and the duration is short. You obviously use lithium ion at the moment, okay? Mm. If the frequency of discharges per year is low, but the duration is high, then hydrogen is becoming increasingly viable, okay? Mm. It's eating into the market that compressed air used to have, and it's interesting to see the, the changes that goes on in this graph. Like, we should have a giant centralized facility that can supply a country's power for like days or weeks, you know? The Texas backup supply. The Texas backup supply that is only used a couple of times a year. You know, or for a business or hospital or something, you know, it's, it's more useful for that. It's like, a, it's like an emergency. Everybody talks about renewables in a negative light because of storage problems. And it's true, we've had storage problems, but it, it's looking like we're increasingly getting to the point that we can say, we're on the right track. Mm -hmm. And hydrogen seems to be part of that solution. And cars are in this range down here. And that is very clearly not a hydrogen zone. But that's why we keep talking about hydrogen. Hydrogen is useful for other things. It, it is useful for the green energy transition. It's just not that useful to directly power a car. Mm. Is there anything else? No, that's basically the conclusion of the video. Thank you, bye. <laughs> Goodbye.